Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm with Literary Arts. Thank you all for being here this evening for Insight Queer Writers Read. Before we get started, I'd like to open up this space with a land acknowledgement. Uh, Literary Arts is based in Portland, Oregon, and we are currently on unceded land. The Maloma, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Walala Bands, the Tualatin Kalpuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River occupied and operated on this land long before Western colonizers arrived, and many continue to do so today. Despite attempts of removal and erasure, these communities remain a strong and vital part of our future. Literary Arts recognizes that this acknowledgement is only a small step in affirming the ongoing presence and contributions of our Native communities, and we commit to engaging these communities more fully as we fulfill our mission. For those of you who are not familiar with Literary Arts, we are a nonprofit community-based arts organization with a 37-year history of serving readers and writers. Our mission is to engage readers, support writers, and to inspire the next generation with great literature. Some of our programs include the Portland Arts and Lectures Program, Programs for Youth, the Oregon Book Awards and Fellowships Program, and the Portland Book Festival. We also offer reader seminars, writing classes, and free literary events like this one year round. And I invite you to check us out over at literary-arts.org. Um, I mentioned before the Book Awards, those are coming up on April 25th. We just announced our finalists. And if you go to our website, you'll see a bunch of upcoming readings uh, with our finalists. So those are fun. I'll turn it over to you too. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jessica. So, well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Insight. Uh, my name is Vinny Kinsella. Um, and I'm seeing some new faces and some new destinations in the chat. So uh, for those of you who aren't quite aware, uh, Insight is a reading series here hosted by Literary Arts featuring all queer writers. It's um, uh, the only all queer writers uh, reading series in Portland, surprisingly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I welcome you all. Um, uh, just to let you know how things flow tonight, we obviously have our featured readers um, who are gonna share their literary goodness with all of us. Uh, and then uh, we will transition to a discussion time and we kind of flip things around how we do discussions here. It's not Q and A with the authors, but it's discussion with each other. So uh, each um, insight, we have a theme and we have some questions that go with that theme. Uh, JP will present that in a moment, um, but uh, so you'll actually get a chance to meet some of your fellow Zoomers. So uh, Jessica already told everyone that um, we are recording the readers tonight and it will be placed on YouTube on the Literary Arts YouTube channel. Uh, where you can also find previous ones. So if you wanted, to, if you were here like the time before and wanted to hear that reading again, you can go back or if you just, you know, need a, night, need a day where you just sit down and let literature wash over you, uh, <laughs> that's a great place to go find that. So uh, a little bit about uh, Zoom etiquette here. Um, we do ask that uh, if you don't want to appear <laughs> in, the, in the video, which uh, doesn't look like that's really going to happen, but maybe accidentally, go ahead and turn your camera off. Um, uh, please remain on mute um, when the readers are reading. And um, if you feel that you are, if your actions might be a distraction, so if you're deciding that you need to dance during the middle of a reading, maybe not have the video on, but, uh, but you're at home, be comfortable, grab something to eat, grab a drink, sit back. We're not, uh, we're not in a, we're not in a highly professional environment here. That's not the word I was looking for, but. <laughs> um, and I do want to point out, uh, we just found out uh, that we, uh, there is, you do have the ability for those of you who want or need, uh, there is a button down at the bottom with, uh, for closed captioning of live transcripts, which you should be able to press and you will see what we are saying. Um, it's live, so I don't know how well it works, but uh, it is definitely a feature that we are glad to be aware of. Uh, for those who need it. So um, yeah, with that, please feel free to share your excitement in the chat uh, with the readers. Uh, give them a hoot hoot and a, we love you <laughs> as we go along. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to JP, our, my co-host. Thanks, Vinny. Hi, everybody. I'm JP or Jennifer Prine, depending on where you may have met me before. You might know either one. 
Um, it's really good to be here tonight with you all and to introduce these readers. Um, I hope that maybe you're familiar with some of their work already. And if not, I hope that you um, get excited about uh, learning some, some new work by these writers. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things before we bring in our first reader. Um, one is that if you want to um, stay up to date on what Insight is doing in the next couple of months, we have a newsletter. I just popped the link to that in the chat. Um, this may not have been such a big deal recently, but increasingly it might be as we are starting to plan for transitioning into in-person hybrid events. Um, so if you would like to um, stay up to date on you know, how best to access uh, these events, that's an excellent way to do it. Um, seeing in the chat too, just recognizing that the closed captioning is modestly coherent. Um, I'll try to do this myself and uh, encourage other folks to do it as well. I know that sometimes the live transcripts work best when we speak slowly. So it's always a struggle for me, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, the other thing that I wanted to mention to you all before we bring in the readers is that um, we have uh, Elisa Safir with us here tonight, who is um, one of our favorite local booksellers um, through another read through. And if you would like to purchase any of the books by tonight's readers, they're all available on the Another Read Through website. If you'd like to check those out, that is also in the chat. Uh, so tonight's theme is Emerge. And as Vinny and I were um, kind of planning for tonight, we were thinking we're right on the cusp of spring. Um, for those of us in the Pacific Northwest, you might be noticing that the flowers are all coming up, the cherry blossoms are starting to pop out on the trees. It feels um, like it's, you know, we're on the cusp of um, coming out of the gray season. Uh, for, for Portland at least. Um, and also we're maybe experiencing some other kinds of seasonal changes um, as we uh, begin to think about how um, a new revised approach to the pandemic yet again, um, other things that may be changing in our collective lives, um, the changes that might be happening with insight as we move to perhaps in-person or hybrid events. So we wanted to kind of share that with you, thinking about how we're emerging from one state into another. And that will also be our discussion questions for tonight when we move into breakouts. So I'm gonna put those in the chat. Um, I'm the kind of person who likes to be able to think ahead a little bit. So if you're this, the same kind of person, um, you might think about you know, what kinds of new seasons are emerging for you personally, collectively, literally, figuratively, um, and when we move into breakouts, we can talk about what you're excited about, what you're maybe a little bit wary about. And then uh, as we think about this space, some of you might be really new to Insight. Some of you I know have been coming for a long time. Um, so as we shift into a new season, are there things that you want to make sure that we retain from this last, um, however long it has been that we've been doing this online? I don't even know at this point, two-ish two years. Um, so those are our discussion questions. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our first reader tonight. Um, Chingyi Chen is a genderqueer Chinese American hybrid writer, community organizer, and teacher. They're the author of The Heart's Traffic and Recombinant, which is a 2018 Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Poetry winner. They're also the author of Chatbooks to Make Black Paper Sing and Kundiman for Kin, Information Retrieval for Monsters, which was a Leslie Scalapino Award finalist. Chen's also the co-editor of The Revolution Starts at Home, Confronting Intimate Violence Within Activist Communities, and Here is a Pen, an anthology of West Coast Kundiman poets. They've received fellowships from Kundiman, Lambda, Watering Hole, Kansarat, Imagining America, and the Jack Straw Cultural Center. I'm going to pop their website in the chat as well as a place where you can find copies of their books. Welcome, Chingy. Thank you so much, uh, JP and Vinny and uh, Literary Arts and um, all of you for being here. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen. Um, 
So let me know if you can't see it. Um, partly it's because um, the shape of the page is often really inspiring to me and I work with that. And, um, and I, I also, as a, as a audience member, like looking at it. Um, so um, this first piece that I'm gonna read is called Lantern Letter, Azuhitsu. And there are some quoted words from Alexis Pauling Gum's M Archive after the end of the world. And um, this was uh, a piece that was written um, during a Kundiman uh, writing ritual led by Kathy Lin Che and Sarah Gepito. Your heart has 10 shadows of red, Elizabeth Soto. My people, I see you across street, porch people huddled under brick archway, watching what pours from sky wading in water, what circuits it carries, mostly numb, small, what might feel like circuits end. Stay home, watch streets filling up and draining and filling up again. My neighbor with no shoes and an umbrella knock on doors to locate whose car in the street flooding up. He knocked on our door and another one fleeting back, knocked a few minutes before and said, Hi, I'm your neighbor. We miss what's been paved over, all branches holding down our dirt, keeping paths flowing away. A lake and library parking lot. Women calling to each other over and above it, heading to their free computer classes. My people of the flashing lights, pulsating throbs. Carbon monoxide, methane, oxides of nitrogen. Cousins released 180,565 up into stream, 287,453 emissions. These are among us too, carried into our stories. If we would have only sung to find each other or taught ourselves to read the waves. If only grown resistance, if only grown resistant skin, hard fired to stand through ravenous beetles stripping off all trees, 33 trillion gallons. What slugs, what acoustic activities swallowed and sat, stared down with glass eyes. Vow to share our four teaspoons of coffee, open back door at your knock, lend the orange cords, handheld pumps, small towels to slick off oil anomalies. Watch for rising sheen and horizon, melting glacier, to remember its full and terrible man-eating weight, to walk through rain down boulders, singing lines of poetry to the bears, announcing, hey, hey, we are here. Don't worry, nothing to see, nothing to eat. If I see you coming, I vow to slow down, walk step beside you, not leave you waiting through sluck, not leave you stacked chairs high for rescue. Hundreds climb silent up the highways, looking for more silence. I'm done with fleeing. Even as you walk beside me, I feared your ever-growing branches would wild out my own tin. I kept saying thank you, nice to pass and cross and leave taking. You waited for me, the only two large clumsies under a finally darkening midnight sky, saying hello again, hello. I vow an impossible hello. So I was thinking about the theme and um, one of the things that I've been doing as a ritual during the pandemic and even I think a little bit before um, and I and I wanted to read um, one of these pieces is um, write to and in conversation with other trans and non-binary writers and artists um, especially in light of what's going on now I think um, I, I think it's really important to um, center these voices. So this was written for Jia Ching Wilson Yang and it's called Hiding More Names. From the large elephant house lighting the path to the dried up well, short shrub of breath, a storm of dust trailing a young thin soldier we left atop the thorns. 
those plying plants so dull, we replaced each lid and refused to bite into them when placed full intact on a plate. Instead, we split our tongues into two caverns and waited. We kept our hair as thin as the mountain. No one told me that I would return. No one asked me who my father was. A wrong sprout in our backyards full of symbols. We grew back our fingers. No bright penny mouth, no man at his throat. I ask your belly, is this wrong? I graze my skin with your palm. You half man, half cyborg, question mark. You chaser, question mark. You crier, question mark. You forest goer, question mark. Flat feet falling in the blood, question mark. You have Z and a coral, question mark. You limb lover, you ape grower, you fig leaf for a shawl, you melter, you hailer of fists, question mark. You sun chaser, question mark. You woman, then man, question mark. You have Z in the woods, question mark. You a chaser, question mark. An encounter, question mark. A kin, question mark. In the lit house, a dried up man come to chase a storm. In another myth, he is father, a plant so dull, he replaced each mouth with leaves. What we cannot say, we wait for. What we cannot grow, we eat. In the dry house, we bite into a bright skin full of flat surfaces. We give pleasure in a lowly way. I can't say where we lost the hair, except to know that it was a family lineage to sprout wrongly and loudly, to arrest your blood in its place, to hail your fists after sun, to demand your farm grow the appropriate fruit by its correct name. In the electronic house, I return to the soldier who has no mother. He views himself as a full thorn intact in the woods. He grows despite himself. In the woods, the men tear his throat with their song. I run after him for protection since he survived this long. He doesn't want my trail, stuffing his fist in his mouth. I persist in the mountain after the scent and the shock of the sky. No one asks me where I'm from anymore. So I've also been writing these uh, spells as, as rituals and um, and I've been thinking about them as little rituals of survival um, and resistance. Uh, so this one is called Another Spell for Whole. And I think that this is gonna be the last piece I share. So I uh, just wanna thank you for listening to my words um, and, and being here with me in the space. Another spell for whole. For you who left scald, birth misery train, who train a box to sing, who cannot return. For you who mutate your own story, who cannot left village, brother with windows, no water could sustain, saw spoiled fish scatter against door. Past demolition, scrambling for false entrance, a mattress haunted with radios. For you stuffed with light, which cannot sing, I never saw your face again. You with a restaurant sister's letter, a clutch upon your wrist. I asked you again how we carry grapefruit and smoke. You knelt with mirror for you who touched your forehead to electric dirt, left your teeth for prayer, collect tinies in exchange for beads or rice. You heat small drops, watch liquid grow brown with clove. I'll trade you penny for poor, for you I leave nothing, bring you a bowl for sky we left behind.
Thank you all. Thanks so much, Chingy. Um, I appreciate you sharing all those different conversations between um, places and situations and people and um, sharing your spells and rituals with us. Um, also your songs for the bears. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna carry that with me as well. Um, our next reader tonight is Emily Moon. Uh, Emily is a transgender poet from Portland, Oregon who began writing poetry in 1971 when she was 13. She stepped out of the poetry closet in 2011, the year she founded the Estacada Poetry Project, uh, or EPP. EPP published Take a Leap, an anthology of Estacada area poets in 2012. Emily is also the editor at First, or an editor at First Matter Press, and her book, It's Just You and Me, Miss Moon, was published by First Matter Press prior to her taking on that editorial role. Her work includes appearances in or forthcoming from Pile Press, Hecate Magazine, Firefly Review, Mulberry Literary, Labyrinth Anthologies, and Brazos River Review. I'm going to pop a link to Emily's book in the chat as well. And please help me welcome Emily. Oh, Emily, I think you're muted. Okay, how's that? <laughs> it's an honor to share this stage with Chin Yin Chen and Michelle Ruiz Kyle. I'm grateful to Literary Arts for this event and to Jennifer Perrine and Vinnie Kinsella for inviting me and for hosting. Um, since childhood, I've always known there's something different about me. Some fear and shame kept buried for most of my life. It kept surfacing and became urgent and insistent over time. A few years ago, I figured out that something different is I am, I am transgender. I began taking steps toward transition three years ago when I was 61. The poems I read tonight mostly come from that experience. Emergence, published by Anti-Heroin Chic in October 2021, was my first poem published as Emily. Emergence, two roads diverged. I took the wrong exit, landed far from home. I leaned into something I could not define or look in the eye. I spun my name from twigs, made a nest for to lay me down. On bright days, I couldn't see. Darkness seeped from my eyes, like fog blowing on shore, oozed from my fingers like a flood, blew into corners and cracks into heat. I suffered the weather I created. I gather the shards of my shattered mirror, puzzle them together. Gaps in the missing pieces shine like the deeps of space. I am those holes, wholly complete, wholly me. And the next poem I'm going to read uh, this is one of my most recent acceptances, and it'll be published in Engendered Magazine in June. It's called This Boy Bod. This boy bod had to carry me all the way here. No one else could do it, would do it. It took every strength, every weakness, every wrong turn I ever made. I succumbed to the tide that rushed me along. I strained against myself, tried to become, tried to be me. The image in the mirror lied. The image inside strived. I was buried so deep, there was no light. All I needed was a spark, a glimmer in the dark. The only place that fire could start was in my heart. It kindled within, unseen. Until I was ready to burn away the dark, burn the dark into day, even though the day was a hurricane, a flood of rain, a river of pain I had to burn through to me. <clears throat> I had my friend Jessica Pierce's luminous book, Consider the Body Winged, on my mind when I began this poem. Tiger Lily in the poem is my dear friend and soul sister, Lily. And this poem will be published in the upcoming issue of Hecate Magazine. <clears throat> Cranes and Other Winged Creatures. 
From the lips of baby stars, kisses of rosy gold twinkle, taints of the divine over the altar of despondency. Construction cranes and other winged creatures, the fly agaric, the red cedar. Fingernails grow into feathers, hands fly away, happy as hamsters. I claim the dream of the tiger lily, of the ornamental brassicas, <clears throat> the aspiration of the fly specked mirror, of the freckled stubble field, of the transgender cheek. Between shell and shelter is a blurry line, flashes with scraps of night sky street lamps in pools of pale blue light. We are glowing bodies in the rosette nebula, twinkles in each other's eye, salt in the wound of love. Coming out. The boiling lava of my molten core bursts through. My husk shatters, falls away like fireworks. The dust of what I was blows away on the breeze. My smoking heart reveals transfiguration. I rise, newly minted, tint the heaven vivid with the light coming out of me. Open as purple. I am open as purple magnolias in May, a spiral of petals of indeterminate number, an elegant blossom bursting with extravagance, sweet as the honey of nostalgia. Storms blow, Yet I grow in this northern climb, climb from the compost of my past, ease into this new body, comfortable in my skin at last. Bright as lightning flash, my gender display shouts things I could never say. Uh, the, follow the following three poems uh, either have been published in Pile Press or, or are going to be published in Pile Press. And Pile Press is uh, Portland uh, Press, an alternative publishing collective for women and non-binary bi non fluid creatives. Miss Moon, at this late hour, I feel my heart grow into a new shape, guaranteed to ease my worried mind, fill the hole I left behind. I am more than the boy I was, more than the girl who, who was always inside. My heart grows greater than the weight of pain, larger than my shame and sorrow. Every humiliation I ever felt shrinks until I am free. I soar without wings. Every self-debasing thought I ever had becomes print so fine it can't be read, and in a flash becomes ash. The sprout growing in that ashen field that tiny green sprig is me, Emily, in the world. My heart opens, attracts possibilities filled with warmth and the affirming song of belonging. Toward dawn, throbbing fatigue quenches my fire, creases the space between my eyes. I crave sleep, sleep won't come. A tree grows from my spine, attracts lichens and insects, moss and nests, leaves me deep in shadow. I want to move, but I've taken root. I yearn for rain, get wind blown fog in my ears. Birds call, squirrels chitter, night brings frost, languor remains. I must move, must move. I rattle my limbs, rip my roots from the earth scatter leaf litter, take weary steps toward dawn. I skirt a cliff edge, precipice at my back, black water below, dark sky above. So far to go, so much to do. Skirting, don't worry, you have a plan. You leapt over the Jersey barrier into the oncoming rush of everyday bullshit that drops from news feeds and spouts from sidewalk cracks. You slip through that messy tangle, smooth as an eel in a reef. Tonight, when you look in the mirror, you've a right to be proud of the reflection. You out monopoly the monopoly board. Fuck boardwalk and park place. You're taking a ride on the Reading. This poem, takes its title from a song by Sophie. 
She was a transgender and amazing electronic musician, composer, songwriter, producer, and performer. The song has this line repeated over and over. Everybody's got to own their body. We follow a chatoyant star through the scintillant night en route to Andromeda and Pleiades. Our ship is sleek and queer as fuck. We pinball through trans-Neptunian space, the rough seas of the Kuiper Belt and the icy Oort cloud banks of the vast beyond. To be trans is to be transgressive. One sky is not enough to hold us. We start tangy, finish smoky. It takes all our energy to do what we do. We swim through waves that tower over our heads. We stare down the cloudy eyes of cis-normative, heteronormative, imperialist, white male supremacist, racist culture. We are free when we own who we are. It's about liminal space we inhabit, the boundaries we shove aside. It's about pain we leave behind, the community we forge. It's about love. It's about loving. It's about loving ourselves. And this is another baby poem. It was written just a few days ago while I was thinking about the theme for this event. Its title is, I Know What It Is. I know what it is to shed a skin grown taut that no longer fits who I am. I know what it is to break a shell that restrained and contained and held me back. I know what it is to form a cocoon and consume myself so I could emerge with wings. I know what it is to break tacit rules and face the weight of unrelenting conditioning. I know what it is to own my body, to be myself, to be free, completely me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. So, so in the before times when we would meet in person, we would have a moment to breathe as the reader a previous reader sat down and the next one got up. So I'm just going to give us all a minute to breathe and digest. We've had two fabulous readers already share with us. Um, but as we like to say in our household after a full meal with dinner to come, we like to say, engage your dessert stomach uh, because there's still more coming at you. So um, allow me to introduce our third reader. Uh, Michelle Ruiz Kyle is the author of the critically acclaimed young adult novels Summer in the City of Roses and All of Us with Wings. Her writing for adults can be found most recently in Bitch, Cosmonauts Avenue, and the anthologies Dispatches from the Honorees, Tales in Tribute to Ursula Le Guin. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. Realize that's one of those words I've only seen in print and never said out loud. Uh, she is a 2021 Tin House Scholar and the recipient in, of residence in Hedgebrook, the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, and the Bloedel Reserve. Born in San Francisco, Michelle has lived in Portland, Oregon for many years where she curates the fairy tale reading series, All Kinds of Fur, and lives with her family in a cottage where the forest meets the city. So welcome, Michelle. Hi, hello everybody. It's so nice to be here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I am actually at one of those residencies right now and I have been by myself so much <laughs> that this really feels like a party to me and I'm really glad just to see faces and to hear beautiful, such beautiful work. Um, I, um, uh, poetry is something that I admire and adore and I'm very afraid to write, but um, I'm, so I'm going to read you a story. Story time is, uh, is a little bit more my speed and um, but, you know, every time I hear poetry read and I see like the courage and the beauty and the sort of, and really the spell it casts, I always think, you know, I should get braver and try some poetry. So you never know. I have a few days of residency left, but um, here we go. Here's, here's the story uh, that I was inspired to read to you after a walk on the beach when I got a little hello from a seal uh, popping up out of the waves an old story. Um, you can find the story, I think, from a few years ago in the Buckland Journal. And, uh, it's been cut a bit for, for length, so hopefully this, this goes okay. Last kiss. The sky is wide, crested with stars. At the lake's edge, it's the same as ever, repelled, attracted, repelled by the unmoving, toothless water. 
but there is the cold of the lake, the weight of it, the way it drinks the moonlight like its mother's milk. I enter slowly, breathing in the winter rut, then submerge and swim to where the lake is coldest and deepest and the slightest bit wild, in spite of its clean, careful shoreline. I am weak now, nothing more than a tasty morsel for some creature to snatch. Once, when he first brought me to Eden Rock, Dill said, you look good enough to eat. Here in the water, it's easier to think of things I like about Dill, not his smell, not the sound of his voice, but other things, qualities of cleverness, the way his long pale fingers tap across the thing he calls a keyboard, the way he trembles when he unlocks one of the secrets hiding in the glowing green box of his computer. At first he trembled when he touched me, his small dull teeth rattling bone against bone. Now his teeth are silent. He knows I'm his. Once from Dill's backyard, I heard the children next door recite, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. I understood then. The song was about someone like me, me and Dill. I kick to the bottom of the lake. The fresh water burns my eyes. My body begins to blue. A bark at the shoreline calls me to surface. It's King, the dog of one of Dill's friends who wanders the neighborhood free. He barks again and will not stop until I come out of the water. When I'm on shore, King runs to me, rising to his hind legs, so tall his head reaches higher than mine, rough paw pads on my bare shoulders. Nose to nose, we sniff. Together, we walk back to Dill's. Every night is the same, my secret walk to the lake, King's rescue, my evening shower in the hidden bathroom, a small clean cove that once belonged to Dill's parents, a place forbidden to the boys who come here every night to marvel at the computer. Dill told me about his family to teach me the meaning of the word photograph. I'd been upset to see a picture of myself taken by the boy, taken the night before by one of the boys who frequented Dill's room, the paper image spit out by the box he called a camera. Dill thought I didn't understand photographs, and he was right, but that's not what made me cry. His explanation proved what I dreaded. The pale girl in the picture was me. When I pointed to a picture of a white-haired man and woman, Dill said, my parents, but they left. They bought a Winnebago. I was thinking about the strange word when I heard a low whisper, a short boy with pocked skin. You'd leave too if that was your kid, he hissed. I heard they were scared shitless of him. I heard he pays them to stay away with his video game money. I heard he threatened them with a butcher knife last time they came home. The last whisper was from a boy who was there to sell them drugs. He looked at me and licked his lips. He'd take me from Dill if he could. Dill needs the drugs to stay awake and work. He does not go to school with the other boys because he is special. He commands the light and endless space inside the computer as no one else can, he says, teaching it language, bending it to his will. After the shower, I dress. He brought me these clothes the day after I arrived. He'd locked me in the bathroom alone in a tub filled with dead clear water, but dried me tenderly when he came back, whispering, sorry, sorry, sorry so that at first I thought Dill believed sorry was my name. The clothes felt good. Sweatshirt, sweatshirt, tank top, flip flop. The way my body is now, it feels right to be covered. The only time I'm naked is when I shower or when Dill and I are alone. That doesn't happen often because of Dill's work and the constant presence of the boys. King follows me to Dill's room. The usual boys are here, rankly sent and dull with smoke no in the airless room with the whole house empty they still congregate in the small space with its single window and enormous bed and desk in the corner the other rooms in the house are off limits no exceptions but i enter them sometimes when dill is at work i am almost asleep when i hear the front door king winds in circles too big for the space between the door and the bed i look up to see king's boy and by his side a girl She's laughing at King here on his own, waiting as he does each night for his boy to arrive. She crouches to pet him, her arm brushing the leg of King's boy, who is a slight and quiet person, as clever with his guitar as Dill is with his computer. The rest of the boys nod at him, and I, the girl. 
I remember that at first, my presence also made them uncomfortable. But unlike me, this girl is not silent. She says hello to the boys whose name she knows and gives her name to the ones who are strangers. I'm Lana. Her voice is high and sweet. I know you from freshman year, Dill says. Yes, she says, from biology. Diana looks and, uh, Lana, excuse me, looks like and smells like a well-rested animal. Her long brown legs sleek under the skirt of her dress. I suddenly want to hide my own legs, pale and scaled with dead skin. I close my eyes and pretend to sleep. After that, she comes almost every night with King's boy. They hold hands as they arrive, but separate in the room. He huddles with other boys around Dill while she sits on the set edge of the bed and grows restless. Unlike the others, she is allowed in the kitchen where she makes popcorn with salt and oil and golden Rice Krispie treats. Sometimes King's boy helps her. Tell us a story, Wendy, King's boy says, hugging her from behind. Lana laughs and pushes him away. Oh, they are a bunch of lost boys, all right, Lana says. She's looking at me. Don't you know Peter Pan? I shake my head. I don't think she speaks English. King's boy sits in the chair beside me and pulls Lana to his lap. Maybe, Lana says. She touches my hand, warm. But you understand it, don't you? I startle. Dill seems to know I understand or speaks to me as if I do, but no one else here ever has. Something is happening to my face, a warmth there, a tensing of the muscles around my mouth. It's King that lets me know I'm smiling. He barks, flinging his tail back and forth and runs to me, nuzzling my hand. His boy and Lana laugh. Another night, I'm in the off-limit parents' bathroom looking at my face. Dull eyes, strange mouth, nothing like Lana. I take the brush in my hand and run it over my tangled hair. The door is open slightly. No one ever comes here. But here is Lana, standing in the doorway. Can I help? She asks. Something in my throat breaches, dives. I make a sound like crying shorebirds. Hot water flows from my eyes. When I quiet, Lana steps back, far enough to really look. Light in this room is like sun trapped in ice, so bright she's sure to see everything. With one finger, she traces the bruises down my arm, touches the faded mark on my neck. Come home with me, she says. My mom's away, but it's okay. She believes in helping people. I, I want to come with you, I say. But Dill, he'll be angry. Fuck Dill, she says. Do you need to get any of your stuff? I think. It feels like the answer should be yes, but I shake my head. Lana squeezes my hand. Wait here, she says. I'll come get you when the coast is clear. On the street in front of Dill's house, King's boy is waiting with his truck. At Lana's house, King leaps out with us. You're staying then? His boy asks King. Must be nice not having a curfew. To Lana, he says, call me later. To me, he says, good night. Lana's home is smaller than Dill's, but finer. The walls are made of clay rough to the touch and painted the colors of sunset. The floors are wooden and smooth under my feet. When will Dill miss me? What will he do? I imagine him on hands and knees in the street, sniffing the road for signs of me, like the monsters in a story he read aloud to me when I first came to Eden Rock. On a hook by the door is a garment made of skin. I touch it and am dizzy, the floor buckling beneath my feet, my knees bending as if they are trying to melt back into my abdomen, reaching towards some other form. I'm crying again, water streaming from my eyes, wetting the black hide coat. King is by my side. Lana is here too, pulling me to the sofa, sitting beside me. I remember, I say, the thing I left at Dill's. Full of the breakfast Lana made, we wait for King's boy to come. At Dill's, the locked door confronts us, but I remember something about the garage. I search Dill's room as they wander the forbidden parts of the house. I know, even if his parents never return, this is the only part of the house Dill will ever consider his. Standing near the bed, remembering the pictures of naked women Dill showed me after I first arrived, I pull back the reeking quilt and find them. Tucked behind Dill's pillow, warm from the heat of the waterbed, women splayed naked like dead fish on the shore. Like mine, their claws are painted red. 
I rip back the sheets, stripping the hateful bed, pulling the sour fabric to the floor like I'm wrestling a many-armed monster. You're back. The voice is Dill's, but it's Monday, a day he always goes to work. I turn to find him in the doorway, shaking as he used to when he touched me in bed. King is between us before Dill can take a second step. Go away, Dill, I say, my hand on King's ruff. Dill opens his mouth to answer, but King's growl stops him. Dill? Lana stands in the doorway. King's boy is behind her. Hey, Dill, he says easily. What's up? What's up? I was out all night looking for her. Dill takes a step closer, his eyes moving from me to King on the now bare bed. Following Dill's gaze, King leaps to the bed, the water sloshing under his weight. Whining, he scratches. Under his paws is a patch, a thicker piece of plastic to cover some puncture in the membrane. He sniffs madly, scraping at the spot with his nose. I know he smells what I smell. Don't, Dill cries. I move to the patch and pull. A slit is there, a tiny gill. I work my blood-tipped nails into the opening, releasing a trickle of warm water. I push deeper to my wrist. My hand is sure and soon touches something sleek and furred and alive. I pull and the slit opens wider, birthing the thing Dill stole from me under the moon on the rocky beach that night. I clutch it to my chest and stand, tall now and enjoying my legs. They stride to him, unafraid. Fuck you, Dill, I say. Fuck you forever. I walk past him, but turn at the strange exhale that slithers from his room. A cry made by both Dill and his bed as King pulls the slit wider, releasing the stagnant water from the bed's bladder to soak the smoke dank room. King lifts his leg, eyes on Dill's, then follows us down the hall and through the garage. We drive away fast down the great wide road that cuts through Eden Rock's quiet neighborhoods. At the beach, I stand with the humans as King frolics in the waves. Thank you, I say to Lana, touching my forehead to hers, an expression of deep affection King taught me during our nights at the lake. Thank you, I say to King's boy and grasp his hand, a kindness I learned from Dill on the days when he was gentle. I kneel when King approaches and wrap my arms around his neck. He tucks his head under my chin and presses his great snout to my heart. I walk away then to the rocks at the edge of the cove. I remove Lana's clothes and the wind takes her silk shirt to meet the sky. I hold my true skin to my face and let the spray taste my human limbs, a first and last kiss. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Michelle. Um, and let's give one more thanks to all of our readers tonight. So Chingy, Emily, and Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your words with us and your and your gifts with us. It's um, it, it's wonderful. Um, and just uh, as I like to remind everybody, um, please support uh, you know support the writers whatever way you can, whether that's giving them a follow on social media to get their numbers up or uh, purchasing their books or just just telling people, I heard this fantastic person last night, you should read last night, you should check them out. So uh, we always love to see our readers supported in that way. So uh, well, we're going to transition now into our